So today I want to talk about hosting and in particular, the fact that you don't need to host your applications on the cloud. Now, if you're a beginner, you're used to working on your code on your local machine and you might deploy that code to GitHub. But if you want people to actually use your applications or be able to see them online, you're going to have to host them on a server. And there are a lot of ways of doing that, not just cloud hosting. But it seems to me that every other week, somebody is getting burned by these cloud providers with really big bills. Case in point, a few weeks ago, the developer of an app called Kara, which is supposed to do some alternative things to Adobe, posted that they received a 90 plus thousand dollar bill from Vercel. And I was talking about this with my students in the Skill Foundry Discord, and I quickly came to realize that a lot of the younger generation either isn't aware that there are other hosting options, or they're intimidated by the thought of setting it up themselves. And after talking with my students and kind of reflecting on it, I I realized two things. First, I had a real significant advantage growing up in the era that I did. You see, when I was young, the internet was not fast. So if you and your friends wanted to do some multiplayer PC gaming without lag, one of the best ways to do it was to have a LAN party local area network. And that's where you and your friends would pack up your PCs, you would go to somebody's house, and you would physically connect your computers and configure a network. And one person would play the host server and the rest of you would connect as clients. But to do this, you had to configure things. You had to understand IP addresses and ports. And this was all necessary to get your gaming on. So we just did it because there was no other option. And then you fast forward to today and you've got Xbox Live, you've got the PlayStation, network, you've got Steam, you don't really have to configure your own servers to play with your friends anymore. You just pick them off the friends list, it connects you two together, and congratulations, you get to play online games. So a lot of the younger generation that's coming into technology didn't have to experience setting up and configuring servers, and that's probably why they're uncomfortable. And then on the other side, you have these cloud providers, and you're talking Microsoft, you're talking Amazon and Google. These guys have massive amounts of money and they put massive amounts of marketing into their cloud products and they have conferences and everything else. And I realized that there are a lot of people who are trying to break into technology and they're getting inundated with this marketing. And a lot of them don't even realize that you don't have to host in the cloud. And in fact, if you're a small or medium sized business, you probably shouldn't be in most situations. So today I'm going to give you a brief overview of the other common types of hosting that you can do. And stick around for the end because I'm also going to talk a little bit about scale and why pre-optimizing for scale is usually an expensive and bad idea. So the first option you have is self-hosting. And that's where you're gonna have your own server and you're gonna store it in your house or at the office and you're gonna do all the configuration to connect that to the internet. Now this isn't as hard as it sounds. You do need a DNS entry, which you can buy at any host like Hover. It costs about $15 a year to have a domain. And then you're also going to have to install your own security like SSL. So you can get certificates and install them and configure them. Now, this is not as intimidating as it sounds. This is a process that you follow and you can find those processes online. The benefit of self-hosting is that you have full control over your environment. And once it's set up, it's almost free. And you don't need a really powerful machine to host up some small web applications or portfolio projects or store your media. In fact, a three to $500 Linux machine can do this just fine. And in my own home, I do this myself. I have a hosted server. I store media, videos, photos, and I back those things up to the cloud and let me assure you it is much cheaper to back up things yourself to something like backblaze than it is to pay for the backup that's included in your iphone and these are all things that are really good for you to learn and it teach you a lot about networks and how applications connect to each other and it will make you a better software developer but with the security it can be intimidating and if you want better reliability, like failover, or you have to manage for power outages or things like that, if your application gets that serious, uh, self-hosting isn't that good. But it's a great place to get started and it's a great place to tinker. But let's be real. 
Self-hosting has a lot of challenges for individuals. Your home internet connection might not be that good. You know, you don't want to be responsible for backups and power failures and security. So the next tier up, which is very affordable, is something called shared hosting. And in shared hosting, you're going to rent just a piece of a server online, but it is your piece. So this is sort of like renting a room in a shared home. They're gonna take care of all the infrastructure, but you're responsible for what happens in that room. Now on the .NET side, I've previously used a host called discountasp.net, and their base package is $10 a month. And for $10, they will give you a place to host your ASP.NET web applications. And it is more than powerful enough for things like a portfolio project or a simple website. Even a small business that just has a website and it doesn't have a lot going on with it will be just fine on these types of shared hosting plans. Now, what are the downsides? The downsides are is that you have very little control over the server. It is configured to host your application and that's about it. They do scale up, you can buy additional services, you can buy database access, and all of it is very affordable. And this is what I recommend if you wanna set up a portfolio site as part of your job search. Go out and buy a domain name and set up some applications and portfolio projects on a shared host. This is next level from hosting your things on GitHub and people will look on that pretty favorably. So if you don't want to self-host, this is your lowest complexity and most affordable solution. And don't be intimidated, it's not that hard. Most hosts provide you with some online file storage and you just need to copy your application in there, minimum configuration, and you'll be up and running. So the next tier up is a dedicated server. And this is instead of renting a room at the house, you're going to rent the entire house. And this isn't as expensive as you might think. There are dedicated server providers like Hetzner in the EU who will sell you a dedicated server for anywhere from $50 to about $750 a month. And let me assure you that $750 server is a beast. It will serve tens of thousands of requests per second on most applications. And it's more than enough for any small and medium business to host their applications on. And it should be considered before you go to the cloud. Now, the downside, dedicated server, similar to self-hosting, you are responsible for configuration, for security, for backups, but if you don't wanna mess with all that, most dedicated server providers will sell you network engineering as a service. So you can pay somebody to be fractionally managing your servers because most small and medium businesses, they don't need a dedicated network engineer for their servers. They just need somebody to get the alerts, log in occasionally, manage the backups, make sure things are updated for security, and you can pay a fractional cost for all of that. Now, going back to the Kara developer, who got the $90,000 bill. If they had rented a $500 a month server with management, the worst thing that would have happened if their app exploded and went viral is it would have started slowing down and maybe a couple requests would have gotten dropped. But unlike cloud providers where you set a spending limit and if it hits that limit, it turns your app off. A dedicated server would have kept chugging along and trying to keep up with the traffic and you could have then easily bought a beefier server and moved your application to there. It would have only taken, you know, maybe eight hours to make that happen and your customers would have been barely inconvenienced and you certainly wouldn't have gotten a $90,000 bill. Now the next tier is called co-location. And in co-location, you buy your servers, but you pay a data center to host them so that they're taking care of all the power needs and air conditioning. And you can even layer in those managed network services in this. This is kind of like buying a condo. You don't own the whole building, but you get all the advantages of the infrastructure. Now, this is a solution that should be considered as part of any cloud strategy. And one of the reasons for this recently came up on DHH's blog. His company moved all of their stuff off the cloud into co-located data centers, and they bought their servers. And he claims in his blog post that he's going to save over a million dollars a year. 
And that's just something I want everybody to keep in their heads. The cloud is convenient. You can do things like auto scaling and things like that, but you pay a lot of money for those services. And in the case of an established business like GHH's, he has a pretty good idea of how much compute and how much server time they need. And they can buy servers, use them for three to five years, not pay all those rental fees, not pay all those cloud fees and save a lot of money. Now, the downside of co-location and owning your own servers is that there is a higher upfront cost because you have to purchase those servers. You have to purchase all the licenses for things like your databases and things like that. That is not cheap. But let me assure you, I'm not picking on the Kara guy, but I'm going to pick on them anyway, you can buy a lot of servers for $90,000. Now let's talk about scale. And scale is kind of a hot button for me as a software architect because there's a lot of people out there that engage in resume driven development. And they want to build these complex infrastructures and applications as if they are going to be the next Netflix. And they're not. And you know what? I'm not going to say that. You could win the lottery and you could become the next Netflix. If that happens, you are probably going to have to redesign your infrastructure and your application anyway. So pre-optimizing that up front is usually a bad idea. And a lot of people who are just getting started or don't have experience building and hosting applications don't realize how massively scalable modern hardware is. So as an example, I'm going to go to a site called SEMrush and these guys will show you what the top ranking websites in the world are. And I specifically want to look at Stack Exchange. This is the organization that runs sites like Stack Overflow. Now we can see here that Stack Overflow is in the top 200 websites worldwide for traffic. It serves over 200 million visitors per month. Most businesses and apps would be lucky to hit this volume of traffic. So how do they serve all these visitors? They must have a pretty robust cloud solution, right? No. On their site, they actually have this infographic that shows you how they host their applications. They don't do cloud hosting. They own their own servers. So here you can see they have nine web servers, each with 64 gig of RAM. These servers are lightly loaded. They're only using between five and 12% of their CPUs, and they're collectively serving thousands of requests per second. They also have four SQL servers that are lightly loaded, and they serve 500 million requests per day. This brings me to another bit of misinformation I see young developers fall for. You don't need no SQL to scale. Relational databases will scale just fine. Five hundred million requests per day, you will be mega rich if your applications ever reach that threshold or you're doing something wrong. Now, this part is a good look for beginners because you notice here they have four database servers, but they're only using two. The other two servers are hot standbys. And what this means is that if something happens and a database goes unavailable, it's going to fail over to the other standby. This is how you keep your application running when things inevitably go wrong. They also have some Rita servers for caching. And what is caching? Caching is one of the top things that you can add to your application to scale. Basically, in any application, there are certain pieces of data or processing that don't need to be repeated because they don't change rapidly. Like for example, if I had a weather forecast for my zip code today, I might load that information and generate a web page to display it. Now, that forecast is not going to change minute to minute. It's That data is probably good for an hour or more. So what caching is, is I'm gonna load that page one time and then I'm gonna store it in memory. And the next time somebody requests it, I'm not gonna ask the database to query the information or the web server to process putting that page together. I'm just gonna give them the rendered page out of the cache. And this is something that really saves you time and volume. And it is something that the Kara developer did wrong. The Vercel people specifically mentioned that they weren't caching any information and that was spiking their CPU load. 
So regardless, with caching, if a thousand people request the same information over the next hour, it's just gonna serve them that thing for memory and it's gonna be great. So all those API calls and database queries just don't have to be run on every request. This, again, I can't emphasize this enough to beginners who follow my channel. Caching is one of the top things you can do to improve your application's performance. So it's something you should learn. So in summary, Stack Exchange has about 20 servers and they can handle over a billion page views per month. You don't get to this scale overnight. And if you're smart about gradually moving your business and applications up to scale, you can save millions of dollars versus directly jumping onto the cloud. Oh, and by the way, their application stack is built in C Sharp and ASP.NET. So don't listen to people on social media when they start talking about this language is faster than that language, which is better than that language. Languages are just tools. You can scale any language with modern hardware as long as you don't architect your application poorly. So I hope that this video helped raise awareness of other solutions for your hosting. In spite of cloud spending on their marketing and all of the stuff you hear on social media, there are other reliable, affordable means of hosting your applications. Happy coding.